Yeah. Oh. Anyway, somehow I got disconnected and then couldn't get connected. I had to wait. Now we're connected. Okay, so we were talking about these different religious uh, traditions. Anybody got any reflections on this? Would you like to? Yes. One uh, thing that I've seen in Delhi, there's a temple called uh, Bhairav Temple and uh, it's a very, very strange kind of ritual that they follow there. So people go and offer wine into, uh, on the, you know, in the temple and then they come out, wine, whiskey, all these, not, uh, alcohol is offered to Karl Bhairav. And then they come out and feast on it. In fact, there are beggars sitting outside who will also be with their glasses and people when they come out, they, will, they give them their offered wine as prashad. So this is one of the most uh, strange places that I've known, at least uh, in my own uh, experience, mm -hmm. where people are offering uh, wine to so-called, uh, you know, temple uh, deity. And then they are also drinking this, uh, this Kal Bhara is, uh, is a temple in uh, Delhi, which is, I think, here near the... Uh, in the Connaught Place area and uh, there is a tradition where people are, all the people who are kind of in that mode like uh, like uh, in this shloka, second shloka or third shloka, Lord says that those who are, you are born in a particular type of mode and then you follow that. So I think people who are in mode of goodness still believe that they are following something but they are doing it completely in my view. Yes, right. This is, well, this is, they have some faith. But their faith is in the mode of ignorance, right? This is, this is an example of uh, worship in the mode of ignorance. The faith, the faith. And so, uh, they have uh, these kind of things, yes? Offering meat, offering alcohol to gods to, in the temple. Anybody else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, in the religion called uh, Jainism, I have uh, seen that uh, when the ladies, they are, uh, they go for sannyasi, that they are called as sadhvis. For the first time when they take up that ritual of living up, uh, the, they give up, they give up everything, they take up renunciation, their hair is pulled out by the other sadhvis who are there in the congregation and they pull it up with the help of their hand, they don't shave it off. Oh. <laughs> And when they, are, when they are pulling it, so each and every sadhvi, each and every matajis, they take the um, turn to pull, up, pull out the hair, so the blood is oozing out. So that is the first way, the first time they uh, do this, so when they are, they are renouncing the material life for the first time. No. So this is also the mode of ignorance, we would think, that the torture, the part torture to inflict suffering, pain onto the body like that. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, what ah, about Gauris? Ah. Yes, Madhuji? Uh, the Gauris who live in the cemetery and they eat on the dead bodies or something like that. Oh, really? Yes, they're the worshippers of Shiva, I think. But not, they don't belong to Shaivites. It's a different, uh, on the darker side, the tantric side. Oh. And they eat, and they eat the flesh, the dead, the, of the dead bodies, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Oh yes. my goodness. Oh. Uh, yes, Maharaj, they take it up from the cemetery uh, where they find these dead bodies. Uh, they burn, they burn it, and they eat it. The agoris. Yeah. So we can see in many different traditions, uh, people have may have strong faith, but it, it's influenced by the different modes of nature. We have to understand what is actually the pure nature, what is the mode of goodness, the pure mode of goodness. It's not just being vegetarian. Just to be a vegetarian, that's the mode of goodness. But when we take prasada, then that is transcendental. And similarly, we also do some fasting, but our fasting just like uh, the Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he used to do full fasting 
dry fasting on a codice. But his father, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, told him, he said, you don't have to do all this. He said, this, in this age, he said, it's not necessary to do all this kind of severe austerity. So after that, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he would do a, like a half day fast and then he would eat fruits in the afternoon. So he took the instruction from his father. And Prabhupada points out that the, the real purpose of Ekadasi is to increase our hearing and chanting. That's what we should be doing on the Kharasi. Uh, so, we want to cultivate the pure, the mode of pure goodness. So, vegetate, just take vegetarian food. And the, the, Prabhupada also explains the importance of uh, taking bath three times a day, that's also very good. Worshipping the deity, someone's doing this kind of work, very much, this is very much the mode of pure goodness. But when people come to Krishna consciousness, then very naturally they come to the level of pure goodness. Because we rise early in the morning, take a bath and go to temple, worship in the temple all morning. Then just take Krishna Prasadam and spend the day, do, devotees, we would go out every day to do Sankirtan, chanting and distributing books, telling people about Krishna. So the whole day is just spent in Krishna consciousness. Without any difficulty we transcend the material nature. So you can see how Krishna consciousness is Transcendental, it doesn't matter if we're coming from the mode of ignorance or the mode of passion, but if we come take up Krishna consciousness, immediately we can transcend. Krishna consciousness is so powerful, brings us up very quickly out of the material nature. Okay, so Krishna speaks first of all about faith and then he goes on. Yes? You, Maharaj, you have a question? Uh, Maharaj, the impersonalists, yes Maharaj, these impersonalists also, they, be, uh, they believe in God but not in the form of God. So, in what mode are they situated? Well, we have to look at how they're practicing. We have to look at, you know, what, what is their behavior. What kind of food do they eat and uh, what scriptures do they follow and what practices do they have? If they're studying Vedanta Sutra, just like, you know, Shankaracharya Ashram, the sannyasis from Shankaracharya, they're very renounced, you know, they're, but their renunciation is often quite dry. You know, it's very, you know, great austerities. Because theirs is the process of negation. They're not eating prasadam. So they think, oh, eating food, that's sense gratification. I had the experience myself. I had one of our cookbooks, a very what, a big, big cookbook with many colored pictures of very nice dishes. So one, one, I was in a Buddhist country and one Buddhist person came up and looked at the book and said, Oh, this is, this is all sense gratification. So they didn't understand that the food was prepared for offering to Krishna. So they think, you know, any, you eat opulent food, oh, it's very bad. You know, you have to be very, you have to do renunciation, dry renunciation. Don't eat and, and like that. So it's not so transcendent. Is it like that it, in the mode of ignorance or is it passion? Well, it can be in the mode of goodness also. It may, may also be in the mode of goodness. Like it can be in the mode of, but it's it's difficult for them to keep the mode of pure goodness. It's not always transcendental. Because often they become very proud 
about their renunciation. You see, that's the problem with that kind of renunciation, that they become, one becomes proud. And so that pride, that's, that's a, a problem. That puts one in the mode of passion. But generally, you know, they're, 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 they're very much in the mode of goodness. But they also, of course, they're offenders against Krishna. They deny the personal form. They deny the transcendental form of the Supreme Lord. And they they're simply speak of the Brahman. They cannot chant the holy name. So very difficult for them to transcend. That's a problem. Even though they may be in the mode of goodness, very difficult for them to actually transcend and to come to, up to pure goodness. Because they won't chant the holy name. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. And all those uh, people who uh, worship the demigods for attaching to the fruits of the results of the fruit actions means they mean, uh, uh, in uh, was here uh, Krishna is saying that those who worship demigods are in the mode of goodness. Yes. Yes, so it's those in the mode of goodness, but they, they they have they have the result oriented mentality. Yes, may have. They may have, yeah, the, usually people worship the demigods to get some material benediction. They want something, right. So that's the mode of passion also, <laughs> you see. Although generally it's written here that worship of the demigods is in the mode of goodness, but Prabhupada's writing here about Panchpasana worshipping the five demigods, and they're worshipping the five demigods for the purpose of liberation. They're not worshipping them for material blessings. So you're speaking about worshipping demigods to get material blessings, that's uh, worship on a lower level. So demigods can be worshipped in different levels. Sometimes people worship the demigods, just, it's the demigod worship is just a means for them to achieve the liberation. And they think ultimately there's only the oneness, there's only the Brahman, but they meditate on the form of some demigod and so that they can come to that Brahman. But they say once they get to the level of Brahman then they don't then there's nothing, then there's no forms. Niraka. So that's their their kind of worship. You see? Maharaj, in that connection, I have one more question. That in Bhagavatam, it says that uh, even the demigods, the worshippers of the you know, the, the devotees, so-called devotees of worshipping the demigods, it is the duty of the demigods to uh, tend them or direct them towards the liberation uh, of the, or getting the uh, Haripadamis, to get the feet of the Lord, feet of the Lord. So does it happen that when, the, when a person worships the demigods, they will direct them again to worship the Lord Krishna? Well, it may happen that the person who is directing you to worship the demigods, they will tell you how the worship, you know, would, you're getting results which are limited and temporary. And so then the person will be a little more thoughtful and he will think about, is there anything higher? Who should I worship to get eternal benefit from? And so in this way then he may come to worship the Supreme Lord. And so worship of the demigods is on the Vedic path. You see, it's encouraged in the Vedas. Because ordinary people, common people, they, they need to get results. They want to see some benefit and the, the demigods are easily pleased to give results quickly. Of course, the results they get are material and they don't last for very long. So then the more thoughtful person will inquire, how can I get the higher benefit? And so then they should learn about, they will learn about the Supreme Lord. So worship of the Supreme Lord is also in the Vedas, but it's not so easily understood from the Vedas. Lord Brahma says, Vedishu durlabham, adurlabham atmabhakto. 
that by the Vedas it's very difficult to know Krishna, but it's very easy to know Krishna from a devotee. So it's like that. You may be lucky. Ordinary people, common people, they just want material benefits, so they worship the demigods. But the more thoughtful, more intelligent people will, will inquire, how can I get something higher, the eternal benefit? And they will, they will be told also, demigods cannot give liberation. So the, one may think, how to get liberation, how to get out from the material world? Okay, we're going to go ahead. So, the worship of the demigods was described there, text number four, the mode of passion, they worship the uh, demons and rakshatas. Prabhupada writes in the purport how even during the war time, people were, one man was worshipping Hitler because he made a lot of money. He was doing the black market business. And because of Hitler, he made a lot of money, so he began to worship Hitler. And then you've got people in the lower mode of ignorance, they worship ghosts and evil spirits. Sometimes they go and worship some, they hear some ghost is living in a tree, and the people, village people, will go and worship a tree. As I said one time, Bhaktivinod hired a man to read Srimad Bhagavatam, because there was some evil spirit residing in a tree. So the man read the whole Srimad Bhagavatam and when he finished the Bhagavatam, then the tree cracked and fell down. <laughs> so these kind of things go on. Okay, so then text 5 and 6 are describing about austerities and penances. Yeah, yes. Sorry for interrupting. Can I ask a question on verse 4? Okay, you can ask. This is the last question. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Here it says, men, men in mode of goodness worship demigods, uh, wherein Lord Himself has said in 7th chapter that those who are Alpamedasam worship demigods. So, how these two things tally? Because here He's saying those in mode of goodness, and there He's saying men of small intelligence. So, yes. It seems a little. Seems a little uh, Confusing. Well, if you read through, if you read through the purport, Prabhupada is explaining how these people are worshiping the five demigods. You see, uh, Prabhupada is talking that they will worship the the, the different Indra, Chandra, Sankhod, and others. Right, those situated generally worship the demigods. Right, so. The idea, the idea is that these demigods are part of the Vedic culture. This is from the Vedic culture, you see, to worship the demigods, give respect to the demigods. We see in the Ramayana, we see also how even Lord Ramachandra worshipped Lord Shiva before he went to Lanka. They generally talk, tell like that. That Lord Rama was showing the example to people because it's the Vedic culture to worship the demigods. It's part of the uh, Varnashram system. That in executing the duties, one should worship, show respect to the de demigods. But at the same time, we should understand they're not supreme. So I was explaining how there's different consciousness, that people, different people will have different consciousness in worshipping the demigods. Not everyone is worshipping them for some material benefit. Some people, they just simply do it as a custom. It's just part of the culture that we go to the temple, we worship this demigod, we offer a coconut, like that. So... The, Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thanks. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number five and six is describing... Maharaj, Maharaj Hare Krishna? Maharaj Hare Krishna, sorry for the disturbance. Maharaj, we cannot see you. I think your video is off. Oh, okay. You want to see me? <laughs> okay, there you sorry, go. Maharaj. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so austerities and penances are described in five and six. How can be in the mode of passion and ignorance? 
not recommended in the scriptures, done out of pride, impelled by lust and attachment, foolish, torture the material elements of the body, as we were hearing. So tor this, this, this kind of thing. This is a mode of passion and ignorance. So, so then go, goes on, text number seven, describing about food. So even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to three modes of nature. The same is true of sacrifice, austerities, and charity. Now hear of the distinction between them. So 8, 9, and 10 describe the food, food in the different modes of nature. This is something which we often need to use to, in our preaching to encourage people about vegetarian diet. You have to tell them how in, this, in Bhagavad Gita Krishna recommends the food in the mode of goodness. Food in the mode of goodness, what will be the qualities? Ayu, ayu sattva balarogya. Ayu, ayu hariti vaipumsa. Food, it means increase the duration of life. Very important, right? Everyone wants to live a longer time. So increase the duration of life. Purify one's existence. Sattva. Give strength, bala, health, arogya, and happiness. Right? Sukha. Satisfaction. Priti. So this is food, all the qualities of food in the mode of goodness. Whereas food in the mode of passion, which is food in the mode of passion means not good for health. You get stomach problems. If you take food too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, burning, such foods are dis that such foods cause distress, misery, and disease, right? Very important, be careful how, what we eat, what foods we eat, if we want to keep our health. Prabhupada was very careful in guiding the devotees. He taught them how to cook and what foods to cook and when, what, what time to eat and what time not to eat how much of things to eat and not to eat too much of certain foods. Taught the devotees how to use the spices. So text 10 describes food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Food that is tasteless, decomposed and putrid and food consisting of remnants of untouchable things is dear to those in the mode of darkness. So then Prabhupada talks about different kinds of food, animal flesh, of course, that's untouchable. Prabhupada explained, he said, milk, butter, cheese and similar products give animal fat in a form which rules out any need for the killing of innocent creatures. It is only through brute mentality that this killing goes on. The civilized method of obtaining needed fat is by milk. Slaughter is a way of subhuman. Protein is amply available through dal, whole wheat, split peas, etc. You know, people often argue, oh, we need to eat meat, no protein. So they don't know there's so much protein available in other foods. We don't need to eat meat just to get protein. Any questions about food in the modes? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question Maharaj. Yes. Uh, many non-devotees quit that it is mentioned that we are not supposed to eat onion and garlic Maharaj. So how do we convince them? How do we convince them not to eat onion and garlic? Oh, yes, Maharaj. Okay, onion and garlic are aphrodisiac. They increase the mode of passion. They increase the lust in the body. 
We already have lust in the body, we're trying to reduce it. But if you eat onions and garlic, we'll increase the lust in the body, we'll increase the passion. We want to cultivate the more goodness. You don't get the more goodness by eating onions and garlic. Mm. Garlic grew out of the dead cow. These are not foods in the mode of goodness. You'll see in, in the Buddhism tradition also, they don't eat these things. They won't eat onion and garlic. And uh, mm -hmm. the even airline pilots flying the air commercial airlines, they're told better not to eat onion and garlic before flying because there's, there's foods that are so passionate, they influence their judgment. They make it difficult for the pilot to judge things properly. So these are some reasons why we don't eat onion and garlic. Onions and garlic Something highly... Huh? Go ahead. Some quotes from the shloka, some shlokas from the Bhagavad Gita to convince them, Maharaj, that we are not supposed to eat. Well, you can... These shlokas may be helpful. You can take that verse number nine. Food in the mode of passion, too bitter, too bitter, too sour, pungent, you know, they eat onion and garlic, you can smell it. Yes. You know, there's so powerful smell from their breath. So these kind of foods, they, they give a lot of problems, they bring disease, you get stomach problems, people suffer from gastric problems, and often people even worse, they may get diabetes. If you want taste, Prabhupada taught, sometimes people argue, oh, there's no taste if there's no onion or... Prabhupada said, you simply use some hing. You know hing? Oh, okay. Asafatita? We use that. Yes, you put that in, that, that will give the, the taste, it's a substitute for the onion. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, those who are shipper of Kali, they offer uh, meat uh, to Kali or some fish uh, and they they take it as prasadam. So Kali is, uh, 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 what, what is, so she, she is uh, a devotee of the Lord. So she, she, will, she will take uh, that, those meat as prasadam? Well, they're doing, they're doing their worship in the mode of ignorance. But, well, it said, it said you can offer the flesh of a goat to Kali, but you can only offer it on the dark moon night. That means once in a month. That is the Vedic law. You can take the goat before Goddess Kali on the dark moon night, meaning once in a month, and you tell the goat, I'm killing you, in the future you can kill me. That is what's done. Well, when they... I, I'm asking Maharaj, uh, what is Kali will eat those meat? Yeah, there's a, in the Vedas it said, you can offer goat, not cow. But it's not pure worship, it's the mode of ignorance. But but it's it's Vedic, yeah. They can they do it. They do it once in a month, and they have to tell the goat, "You kill. I'm going to kill you. You can kill me in the future." The goat will come back and kill the. Thank you, Maharaj. Hmm? Hare Krishna Maharaj. One more question. Uh, coffee and tea. Coffee and tea, well, they're, they're intoxicants, you become addicted to them. Just, you know, you drink tea, coffee, you can't, you, you can't get by without them, you become attached to it. Some people, they, they can, you cannot get up in the morning without a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. You become dependent on it, you know, it's a drug. Caffeine, the, it's a caffeine. 
Well, drugs, definitely. You can see, what does it say about the, the mode of food? Uh, food in the mode, food's prepared more than food consistent remnants, untouchable things. Yeah, you know, it's, it's certainly the mode of ignorance, yeah. You can see, you drink tea, or you put tea, you can see how it stains, the stains which leave there. If you leave tea in a, a cup or coffee, you leave them, how, how much they stain the something. And so they do the same, you take these things, it's not going to purify us. You drink them, certainly you, you, they're going to infect the stomach. The caffeine, you become addicted, you need that, you need that boost from the caffeine. It's just simply another intoxicant. We don't take intoxication. So it's, it's a mode of ignorance. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so after describing food in the modes, the next thing is sacrifice in the modes. Text number 11 describes sacrificing goodness. Sacrifice performed according to direction of scripture as a matter of duty by those who desire no reward is of the nature of goodness. What sacrifice can we do? What's the best, sac what's the best sacrifice to do? Huh? Yes, Sankirtan Yagya, right. Kali Yuga Dharma Harinam Sankirtan. Sankirtan Yagya, that's the Yuga Dharma. Very easy. This is duty, right? Do the chanting of the holy name. We do it without reward. We do it because also authorized by the scriptures. Very nice, right? Very easy to perform and we get the greatest benefit. So following scriptures, that's important. Then after discussing about scripture, text 14 goes on to describe about austerity. Austerity, first of all, they're discussing, uh, there's austerity of the body, austerity of the speech, and austerity of the mind. Which one is the easiest? Which one will be the most difficult? Which one will be the easiest? Body is easiest. Mind, mind, is, yeah, mind is difficult, Maharaj. Mind is the most difficult, the body is the easiest, right. So he be, Krishna begins with the easiest one first, austerity of the body. So how is that described? What, what is the austerity of the body? What do we need to do? Text 14 describes worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmanas, the spiritual master and superiors like the father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy and non-violence. So these are the principles of uh, austerity of the body. Uh, sometime, one time, at least, there was a, an incident, Prabhupada uh, had his disciple, was a big, powerful man, American name, his name was Brahmananda, and he was very big and powerful. One time his mother came there to see Prabhupada. So Brahmananda introduced his mother to Prabhupada, and when Prabhupada heard this was Brahmananda's mother, he told Brahmananda, he said, you bow down to your mother. <laughs> and so Brahmananda got down on his knees and he begged, bowed down to his mother <laughs> because Prabhupada told him to do it. So Prabhupada taught the devotees to respect their mother and father in that way. 
So worship of the superiors, just like we do Guru Puja, and we worship the deity and like that. So we're doing this austerity, we do this every day. This is a very nice program. And then cleanliness, internal and external. Internal by chanting the holy name and remembering Krishna. And external by bathing, regularly washing the cloth, changing the dress. It's important training people after use the toilet, you should take bath, full bath after evacuating like that. This is keeping clean. And then simplicity, simple living, high thinking. Celibacy, that is for people who are Brahmachari, sannyasi, in household and life there is also celibacy, that the, their, their, the relationship between the husband and wife is religious. So it's not against the principle of celibacy. So we say, grihasta brahmachari, although one may be in family life, he's also brahmachari, because he's associating with his wife according to religious principles. And then non-violent, meaning we're trying to give everyone Krishna consciousness. We're not op opposing the principle giving Krishna consciousness. So next one, 15, austerity of speech. consists in speaking words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial, and not agitating to others, and also in regularly reciting Vedic literature. Speaking words which are truthful and pleasing. Prabhupada quoted the, there's a Sanskrit saying, Satyam bruyat priyam bruyat. That when we speak the truth, it said you should make it pleasing. So, it, but, but Prabhupada points out, he said, that is a social etiquette. In social life, we should speak the truth and we should try to make it pleasing for people. But when it comes to preaching, just like Srila Prabhupada in the course of his speaking the Krishna conscious philosophy, sometimes he would criticize others and you point out the wrong. So sometimes people would get upset and they would complain that why are you criticizing? But Prabhupada says, well, we are preaching. We have to speak the truth. You may like it or not. We cannot change the philosophy. Prabhupada also explains, mentioned in the purport here, that uh, it says, one should not speak in such a way as to agitate the minds of others. Of course, when a teacher speaks, he can speak the truth for the instruction of his students. But such a teacher should not speak to those who are not his students if he will agitate their minds. So this is an important point in etiquette, in, especially sometimes in, in temples where we have many people, different devotees. So sometimes you get one devotee comes along and he starts telling another devotee, Oh no, you did it wrong, you shouldn't have done that, this is no good. And he starts criticizing them and the devotee gets very upset. And so Prabhupada is saying that we don't try to instruct people unless they're our, our student. They have to, be, they have to ex be able to accept your instruction, they have to see you as their guide, as their teacher. Otherwise, to try to instruct them will not be very good. 
And so this is a subtle point. We often get problems, you know, people arguing, different devotees not able to get along with each other. Do, someone will say, do I have to listen to her? Why she talks, why he talks like that? Why I have to talk, listen to him? Who is he to tell me? <laughs> you know, like this, people try to, sometimes we try to, somebody tries to instruct someone, but they're not really the, the teacher. And the other devotee hasn't accepted, they don't see them as the teacher. So this creates problems. So this is austerity in speech. To be able to speak the truth and at the same time make it pleasing. Any questions about this? I have one question, 14. Yeah? Text 14. Now here it is said that uh, Krishna is saying that uh, father and mother is worshipping father and mother. But if father, there are two conditions. In one condition, father and mother are not devotees. Okay, so how we can deal with them? They're how not can... they're not devotees, but still we have to respect them. Uh -huh. Just because they're not devotees, that doesn't take mean care we. Of the father and mother. Huh? Respect will be there, but taking because when we stay with them, if the person is staying with them, yes, okay, it is impedance for him. It will be impedance for his growth. One condition. In other condition, the the, the father mother are devotees. Okay. But uh, to uh, to progress in uh, in the life or in in, in uh, devotional service, he, he may have to leave them and go out somewhere else. So how we can take this? You you mean that the son may have to leave the mother and father? Yeah. For so purpose of preaching or something like that, they have to get aparted. In one condition, the, the father and mother are devotees, in other condition, they are not devotees. In both conditions, how we can deal? Well, in both ways, we have to respect the mother and father, whether they are devotee or not. If you are staying together, if the, the mother and father are living with you, you, you have a, a duty to show them proper respect, that they have raised you, you know, by the, by the grace of Krishna, we have become a devotee. Mother and father may not be devotees, but still, we have to respect them. Now, respect them is one thing. It doesn't mean we have to compromise in our principles of Krishna consciousness. You know, they may not like that you're vegetarian. They may not like that you chant Hare Krishna and everything, but you can't do anything about that. At the same time, you know, we show them proper respect, okay, okay. You know, you do, you do what you like, I do what I like. You know, you're not a child anymore, you're not, you're not children anymore, although you give them proper respect as seniors, but at the same time you don't give up your Krishna consciousness for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got it, got it. And one more question, 15. Uh, the truthful and pleasing, the Satyam Brayat, Priyam Brayat, the maid and the Satyam may not be pleasing. Now we, as you can like Prabhupada is saying, it is the teacher speaking to the student, uh, no need to be pleasing, it should be only truthful, you got to guide him. We just uh, reverse the way, the, the, the student and the teacher, the student wants to tell something to the teacher, and uh, it is truth, but it is not pleasing. So in such condition, the truth shall be, uh, means it should be pleasing to the teacher, Although it may be uh, not the truth. Well, it's not really the student's job to tell something to the teacher. The teacher is the one to tell the student. The student's not there to tell the teacher. The student's there to ask, to inquire, and to learn from the teacher. So there's something, yeah, there's something wrong there. The, the student is telling the teacher. You know, the student doesn't have that position, doesn't have that right. Yeah, I understood. But in case the teacher is asking something and we are finding uh, we is not pleasing the teacher, so we should not say, we should keep quiet. Means at the time, we should say only the pleasing things. Well, certainly, you have to respect the teacher. 
And if you say something which is not respectful, then it's not good. You, then the, the teacher may not teach you anymore. If we accept some, if we accept, we accept someone as a teacher. We have to give them the proper respect, and we have to. That means hearing from them. Just, just like Prabhupada told us, he said, right or wrong, the spiritual master is always right. <laughs> you know, you may not, we may not like what the teacher says, but they're the teacher. We have to accept what they say. It's like that. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. It's a little difficult. Okay, then text 15 goes on to describe about, oh, a 16, describing about the austerity of the mind. So, satisfaction, simplicity, gravity, self-control, and purification of one's existence are the austerities of the mind. Right? Very important for us to control the mind. And Prabhupada writes, he said, to make the mind austere is to detach it from sense gratification. It should be so trained that it can be always thinking of doing good for others. The best training for the mind is gravity in thought. One should not deviate from Krishna consciousness and must always avoid sense gratification. To purify one's nature is to become Krishna conscious. Satisfaction of the mind can be obtained only by taking the mind away from thoughts of sense gratification. <laughs> so it's, it's important for us to uh, try to cultivate this uh, mode of goodness. The mind can elevate us, the mind can degrade us. So how, to, how we use the mind is very important. And the business of one in the mode of goodness is to be satisfied in whatever position he is in. In the mode of passion, we're always changing, go here, go there, give up this, stop doing that, go there, do something else. But in the mode of goodness, we, we just want to be steady and be, okay, you know, stay and what, continue in one service, be steady. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu liked to see the devotees very steady in their service. When Gadarhar Pandit wanted to leave Jagannath Puri and follow Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya chastised him. He said, no, you have your deity here, you have to worship your deity. You should, you made a vow, you should keep your vow. So like that, we come to Krishna consciousness, we make a vow to chant Hare Krishna, follow principles. We should be satisfied. We shouldn't think, oh, Guru gave me so much trouble, I have to do all this chanting, I have to do all this puja. Oh, sometimes we think so much trouble. No, we should be satisfied very important for us. And devotee can be satisfied anywhere, wherever he, wherever he goes. He sees everywhere the same. Heaven and hell and liberation, it's all the same for the devotee. Just like you go to Dubai, you go back to India, just be the same, the same lifestyle. Wake up, chant Hare Krishna, read the scriptures, do puja, go to job. Like, why any difference? Just the same. So this is controlling the mind. Make friends with the mind. Very important for us. Hare Krishna? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then next one. Penance. 17, 18, 19, penance.
penance performed, but we, we were reading about austerity, that's the same as penance. So we did the austerity in goodness and austerity or penance in passion. It's for the sake of respect and honor and respect in the mode of ignorance is done out of foolishness, self-torture to destroy or injure others. Okay, and then 20, 21, 22 describe charity in the modes. Now this is an important point because devotees often get confused about this, about what kind of charity is proper and what is improper. I think we've got something on our PowerPoint about this. I'll just show you. Let's have a look here. Mm. Oh, just a minute. Okay, we can read this. There's an important quote here about faith. Prabhupada is saying, If one is cultivating his life like hogs and cats and dogs, the behavior is also like that and remaining in that position. So his faith, and one who is advanced, who is worshipping the deity, having three times bath, chanting mantra, Hare Krishna, they are not equal. That is not possible. One is situated in sattvagun and the other is in tamagun. Although the tamagun, the persons who are in the darkness of knowledge, they have got their faith, it is not that they have no faith, they've got faith, but that faith is in the lowest status of life. That faith will not help him for spiritual realization. Okay. Austerity in the modes we spoke about, goodness, passion and ignorance, right? The body, use the body to worship the superiors. Right? Mother and father, brahmanas, guru, words. How do you use words in the mode of goodness? Reciting Vedic scriptures, speaking words which are pleasing. And for the mind, satisfaction. Satisfaction and then what else? Self-control, these kind of things. Austerity of speech, truthful, pleasing, not that. Okay. Prabhupada says here, it is social convention that if you want to speak truth, you speak truth very palatable, flattery. Don't speak unpalatable truth. But we are not meant for that purpose, social convention. We are preacher. We are servant of God. We must speak the real truth. You may like it or may not like it, that a godless civilization cannot be happy in any stage. That is a fact. So this is Prabhupada, college students, his college students, they didn't like what Prabhupada was saying. Prabhupada said, I don't care what you like. <laughs> so now charity in the modes. Three kinds of charity. Sadvik, Rajasik, Tamasik. Sadvik charity, done with due consideration, that is the worthy place to give charity in the hands of a Brahmana and Vaishnava because they will employ whatever you give them in the service of the Lord. Charity in passion, oh people who say, I am so charitable, that is Rajasik. And Tamasik? one who does not know where the money is going. Just like in the Bowery Street, in New York, Prabhupada was living near there. Just like in Bowery Street, that drunkard comes and polishes the motor car and somebody gives five dollars and he immediately goes to drink. That means this charity gives him impetus for drinking. So if charity creates such a drunkard, that is very dangerous. He has to suffer, the man who is giving in charity. 
So giving in charity can bring you suffering. You have to be very careful. Um, so we see like at this time with the uh, with people uh, out of work, the e economic situation is very unpredictable at this time and many people are affected, particularly in places like India, because they would live more from one day to the next. And for such a long time to have no work becomes very difficult for them to get food. So we are inclined to help them. But Prabhupada explains, and not only Prabhupada, Lord Krishna is explaining that charity should always be done with discrimination. You should think carefully. Oh. have a connection problem. The Zoom is unstable. So... Hare Krishna. Oh, Hare Krishna. You come back. Very good. Yes. I, I got disconnected for a while there. Uh, very quickly you have come back, Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah, very quick. Yeah. So we were talking about charity in the modes and I, Prabhupada writes here that uh, he said, uh, charity to the poor is sometimes given out of compassion. But if a poor man is not worthy giving charity to, then there is no spiritual advancement. In other words, indiscriminate charity is not recommended in the Vedic literature. <laughs> so we should be careful about who we give charity to. That's the point. We see what's mentioned here. Uh, go to a holy place. Lord Krishna came to Kurukshetra with his wives and his family, all of his family, they came there to Kurukshetra when there was a solar eclipse. And that's a good time to give charity. Lord Krishna came there and gave charity to all the great sages. They'd also come. So should we give charity to, to beggars? Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he chastised his disciples because they were coming to Mayapur on Parikrama and when they were going Parikrama sometimes they wouldn't give any donations to the beggars. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati told him that he said these beggars in the Holy Dham are pious. He said and when you come to Parikrama it's the, it's the etiquette, it's the duty to give some charity. But you don't have to give a lot of charity, you give some small charity. And we see like most of these beggars usually in the Holy Dham, you give them a rupee or two, they're okay, like that. You give them some small ch charity. But it's proper to give charity in the holy place. Are there any questions on this? No, we can give charity by giving prasadam instead of giving money to avoid the misuse of that or any clothes is it like like that we can give like that is yeah. right yes you can also do like that yes yeah we know we have a food for life program the devotees also they like to give to do food distribution you can also do that kind of charity yes there's giving in ca giving cash or in kind yes 
Madhuji, uh, question. What about if, if someone wants uh, financial help for marriage or education or medication or for orphanage and old, old age homes and such places, Maharaj? Well, that's material charity, right? You're not going to get spiritual advancement from that kind of charity. So that's just a pious activity. Yes, a pious activity. right. Whatever charity you give like that, it will come back to you. You give for the old folks' home, in the future you can also go and live in the old folks' home. That may also... You also. Huh? Sorry? Is, but that is encouraged or you should not do... Uh, is that material charity encouraged or no, Prabhu Maharaj? Well, it's, it's not the highest charity. It's, it's just a pious activity. So, you have to consider what you want, you know. What do you want? To, do you want to do devotional service or do you just want to do some? Now, sometimes we're obliged to give, you know, that some, you know, you may... So, you, you give some appropriate contribution, but you may, you know, just, you know, people expect you to give, so you have to give something. but. You can restrict, how, you don't have to give as much as what you, you'd be capable of giving. You can give some smaller, smaller for, uh, amount of charity. Understanding that it's material charity, that it's just only binding you to the material world, you know, it's, a, it's a, just a, a good car, another good karma. So good karma keeps you in the material world also. Correct. Okay. Right, Maharaj. Got it. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. So, Maharaj, in the same line, if, uh, I mean, amidst this COVID, uh, many many families have been impacted because they have lost job and salary cut. So, if, if there is a friend or some family whom we know who are asking for some help, so in that case, uh, how should we look at this matter? Because in the previous slide, which you showed Prabhu uh, Maharaj that if Prabhupada said if we uh, uh, if we give some charity to someone and if he spends it in say drinking consuming alcohol that can come back to us so in this case if the family is affected but if they are asking for some financial help we do not know what they but I let's say this COVID situation also how do we look at it Maharaj? Well you have to consider yourself, uh, these people, are they devotees or if they're not devotees, are they going to eat meat, are they going to drink alcohol? You definitely don't want to support that kind of activity. So, Maharaj, in this case, uh, I mean, let's say the friend uh, is consuming meat, but at the same time he, is, he has lost his job. So right now he doesn't even have, uh, uh, he is struggling with even getting food grains. So I am not sure, I mean, uh, if, if we help them, if we help him, he may probably also end up getting some uh, meat food or something along with rice and uh, other necessary commodities. So how should we look at it? Should we ignore it or because we have been knowing this person for a long time, so how do we look at it? Because what? seeing them directly, no, would also, uh, it, it may, it may sound little well, kind of it's not good for you, certainly. It certainly doesn't help you to give them charity to, so that they can purchase meat. It's bringing you some reactions. So you have to be cautious about these things. You have, you know, you, you can talk with your friend frankly and tell him that, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to support your meat eating. Now it may be hard, it may be painful, but you have to speak the truth. Why, why should you encourage them with their meat eating? I, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I think 
Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think this point is uh, very good, Maharaj. If we if we frankly tell them that we don't support meat eating, probably they also we think in that direction later on, you know, because they are getting the help right now for their basic necessity. But then if we express this thing, probably later on they will think in that direction and they'd also slowly turn to uh, vegetarian, you know. Yeah, now is a good time. It's good preaching to people. You know, many times they're saying that this disease has come about because of some animals, some you know, dead animals or something from the animals. It's something to do with the animals. You know, so many diseases they come from the animals: the swine flu and the foot and mouth disease and the mad cow disease. It's all from the animals. <laughs> how people are abusing the animals, how they're raising animals, different animals for slaughter, and results in all these diseases. And people are still eating meat. So, this person, he still wants to eat meat. And you, you, can t you, you should say like, you know, you meat eaters are responsible for all this. This epidemic which went on, uh, uh, this pandemic situation which is all over the world, this is because of all these meat eaters. If people were not eating meat, we wouldn't have this problem. They themselves are responsible. So why would we come and help them to eat more meat? Here, take some money, go and buy some more meat for yourself. You know, it's, it's, that would be very foolish of our, on our part. I, know, we should... I, I agree, Maharaj. Uh, but, but here, uh, Maharaj, uh, probably... Uh, the discussion that would go on with the person who is in need may not be directly, we may not be speaking on the uh, meat eating. So he would just ask, we are, uh, let, let's say he would say that I am in a final crisis, I want something to support my family. So let's say we speak about the, we take up the discussion saying that I do not support meat eating. So if it does for the food grains, yes, take this, this is some money. But then eventually we do not know behind the scene if he ends up taking drink, consuming alcohol or drinking meat, eating meat or something. Then would this karma reaction again come back to us or how does Yes, it karma will come back to you. It will come back to you. That's a fact. It's stated here. That's why it said, you know, this is charity in the mode of ignorance. You give the, you don't know where the money is going. You don't know what it's going to do with it. This is charity in the mode of ignorance. So charity is done with discrimination. And be very careful. You, you tell him we want to eat, come to my house. Come and eat with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, what if it is a family member or you have to help out? It's our duty, right? We cannot say no. What do we have to do then? Well, it's your duty to educate also. It's your duty to guide the family members to a higher standard. You can also... You should point out... But they're older to us and they may not be to and that Old, older people that they're still eating meat, they're very foolish. Yes, yes. They have very poor digestion. They still want to eat meat. It's very stupid. You have to preach. You have to tell them you're you're already old. It's not good for your health. Why I should give you meat to eat? It's not good for you. It's just bringing death quicker to them. You want you want their old people to die quicker. That's why you're giving them meat. No, you want them to live. So you should give them nice vegetables and fruit and grains. Why do they need to eat the meat? You have to be a little strong about this. You have to be convinced what's right. Anyway, if you want to take the karma, what can we do? difficult to convince them, Maharaj, but okay, I got the point. Thank yeah. you, Maharaj. Yeah, I know it's difficult to convince them, yeah. Maharaj, thank you, very clear. What you are saying is very clear to us now, yeah. Thank well, Krishna is saying, I'm just telling, we're just taking what Krishna said here. And Prabhupada is also making it very clear, you know. Be, be careful in giving charity. Do it with discrimination, otherwise 
you know, we get the reaction. Okay, we'll go ahead, we still have that last section here of the, the chapter. So, uh, after charity, then we hear about this uh, chanting of, oh, wait, just a minute. From the beginning of creation, the three words, Om Tat Sat, were used to indicate the Supreme Absolute Truth. These three symbolic representations were used by Brahmanas while chanting the hymns of the Vedas and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the Supreme. Therefore, transcendentalists undertaking performance of sacrifice, charity and penance in accordance with scriptural regulation, begin always with Om to attain the Supreme. Okay. Without desiring fruitive results, one should perform various kinds of sacrifice, penance and charity with the word Tat. The purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from material entanglement. The Absolute Truth is the objective of devotional sacrifice and it is indicated by the word Sat. The performer of such sacrifice is also called Sat, as are all works of sacrifice, penance and charity, which true to the Absolute Nature are performed to please the Supreme Person. Anything done a sacrifice, charity or penance without faith in the Supreme, O son of Prita, is impermanent. It is called asat and it is useless both in this life and the next. So uh, this little section on the end of the chapter, Lord Krishna is describing how we can purify all of our activities by remembering the Lord by simply saying, Om Tat Sat. And Srila Prabhupada often when he would write letters, you could see sometimes he'd end it, Om Tat Sat. He'd write there. So, important thing, faith. Anything done without the transcendental objective, whether it be sacrifice, charity or penance, is useless. Therefore, in this verse it is declared, such activities are abominable. Everything should be done for the Supreme in Krishna Consciousness. Without such faith and without the proper guidance, there can never be any fruit. Okay. So we're hearing... I'm sorry, we're okay. hearing... Okay. Huh? No, no, fine. So, uh, we, we have heard from uh, chapter 13 up to chapter 17, the importance of the mode of goodness, cultivating the mode of goodness, coming to the mode of goodness and then ultimately transcending the modes of material nature. And by practice of Krishna consciousness, we can transcend all the modes of nature, come up to the transcendental platform. Here you can see, oh that's the 18th chapter, but here's some quotes from Prabhupada first of all. Just to finish off, this is from chapter 16. One has to raise himself at least to the mode of goodness. Before the path to understanding the Supreme Lord. Without raising oneself to the standard of the mode of goodness, one remains in ignorance and passion, which are the cause of demoniac life. Another quote. Without coming to the platform of sattva gun, nobody can advance in spiritual life. That is a fact. Just like nobody is allowed to enter law college unless he is graduate. This restriction is there 
what he will understand. He must be a graduate. So similarly, first of all, Oh, welcome back, very quick. Oh. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Very unstable here today. Okay, here we go. Since the present civilization is not very congenial to the living entities, Krishna consciousness is recommended. Through Krishna consciousness, society will develop the mode of goodness. When the mode of goodness is developed, people will see things as they are. Even one is not in goodness, even one is in the darkest position, of the quality of ignorance, so he can be immediately elevated to the spiritual platform. So this Krishna consciousness movement is directly offering the spiritual platform above the mode of goodness. The quality of goodness will automatically be there. The Srimad Bhagavatam. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes, passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness and he becomes completely happy. Okay, so here's the points we covered tonight. We went over chapter 17. We didn't look at 18. We talked about different religious practices. Krishna's analysis in the modes, how different religious practices are influenced by the modes of passion, ignorance and sometimes goodness also. We talked about appropriate and inappropriate charity, important. And we're also hearing about the importance of developing the mode of goodness in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Right? Sacrifice, austerity, charity, food and Krishna consciousness is independent of the mode of goodness. In other words, you, you don't have to be in the mode, you can come up from passion and ignorance straight to Krishna consciousness. People, because people have no education in actual knowledge, they become irresponsible. To stop this irresponsibility, education for developing the mode of goodness of the people in general must be there. When they are actually educated in the mode of goodness, they will become sober, in full knowledge of things as they are. Then people will be happy and prosperous. Even if the majority of people aren't happy and prosperous, if a certain percentage of the population develop Krishna consciousness and become situated in the mode of goodness, then there is the possibility for peace and prosperity all over the world. Okay? Do we have some more questions there? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, how to increase our faith in Krishna? <laughs> how to increase our faith in Krishna? Well, one way in which you can increase your faith in Krishna is by associating with people who have faith in Krishna. Association is very important. If you can get good association with devotees who have strong faith, then it can be very helpful for you. Another way in which you can get faith also is by following the process very carefully 
and you should see, you will see how it works, you will see how quickly you change, how you, you, you give up your bad habits. So you get faith by uh, understanding the process, practicing the principles. You can also develop more faith through hearing, hearing from the devotees more. Because they, they, when they speak, they will have strong faith and it will inspire you more also. So like that faith is in stages, we say it, it may be weak and then, then it can become stronger. It will take a little time. You have to continue to follow the process regularly, hearing and chanting and your faith will gradually become stronger. You'll get more and more, you'll become more and more convinced that Krishna consciousness is very powerful and very effective and it's helping you. Right? Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Is it not that uh, along with our endeavors, what you have said, uh, the mercy of uh, the Lord is also very important and we should take the mercy of the Lord along with us so and then only we can progress uh, more and much? The mercy of the Lord is important, yes. We need the mercy of the Lord. The mercy of the Lord comes through the devotees. The devotees are delivering the Lord's mercy. But it's not only mercy, because if we think it's just the mercy of the Lord, then we won't make any effort on our part. So Prabhupada when he would speak about mercy, he would say just like uh, honorary degree. You know, who gets an honorary degree? It's not very common. Rabindranath Tagore, he got honorary degree from Oxford. But it's not very common, very rare. So the same way, to get the Lord's mercy, it's not so easy. One, of, one, thi one thing which we learn from uh, Bhakti Yoga is that Krishna rarely gives the mercy. Why? Why does He rarely give that mercy? Because Krishna becomes obliged to the devotees. When, when He gives the mercy to the devotee, just like Krishna became the chariot driver for Arjuna and Krishna had to, be, to become a messenger for Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Krishna becomes obligated to his pure devotees. So therefore Krishna himself does not so readily give the mercy. But his devotees are more merciful than him. So you want to get Krishna's mercy you get Krishna's mercy through his devotees. They're more merciful than Krishna. But you attract the mercy of the devotee by your behavior, by your sadhana, by your own practice of Krishna consciousness. If the devotees see that you're working very hard and trying very sincerely, to advance in Krishna consciousness, then certainly they will bless you. They will give you their blessings. And with the blessings of the devotee, you get the blessings of Krishna. And so we, Prabhupada would say, if, if you want to help your, if, if you want, uh, if you want to help yourself, if you want Krishna to help you, first you have to help yourself. God helps those who help themselves. So you want to get Krishna's blessings, you have to attract Krishna's blessings. And you don't attract Krishna's blessing by doing nothing. And so we have, to, we, have to, you know, we have to make some effort on our part to become Krishna conscious. We have to do our chanting, we have to do our service. And in this way we become more 
qualified to get the mercy of Krishna. Is that all right? Can I understand? Yes, Maharaj, thank you so much. Maharaj, I have a question. We learned about aphrodisiac foods in text number 9 today. So there are some other foods like fenugreek, honey, saffron, which also have very high aphrodisiac value. So should we consume them or should we ignore them? You, you mentioned saffron and what else? Saffron, honey, fenugreek. Oh, honey, fenugreek. Yeah, of course, these things they can be they can be used, but in moderation. They they, they can be used. They can be offered to Krishna. Lord Balaram was very fond of honey. So you know, we often 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 will offer offer some honey to Lord Balaram. And fenugreek. Fenugreek is a, a spice which is used sometimes for some preparations. It's used. Saffron also, very small quantity, very expensive something. Used very carefully. But they're not in, they're, they're not uh, pungent. They're not, you know, they're not known to be in the mode of ignorance or passion. Generally, you, saffron especially is used in the worship of the deity. We offer to Krishna tulsi leaves with saffron and sandalwood paste. When we grind the sandalwood paste, we often put in some saffron in there. So, very small quantities, but can be used, yes. be still used, yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. I have one last question. So, uh, we just, uh, I have a question. The situation is, let's say uh, we, uh, let's say I purchase a flat, either from a developer or from a seller, a house or a flat, but uh, I do not know the, uh, the money which I'm going to pay to this particular developer or the seller is going to use for a good use or for some other usage. Uh, will that still be called as a, a mode of ignorance? No, because you're using the money to purchase something. You're not, use, you're not giving the money to, directly to them. You're giving the money in exchange for the purchase of some property. How they use the money, how they use the money, that's their problem, their responsibility, their karma. You don't get that karma. Okay, so if, but if we rent the property which is a reverse, then it is our karma. No, you rent the property, you're paying the money for the rent, for the property. But let's say if we receive the rent from the property, uh -huh. and we don't know what they are using the property for, it's our karma, if they're doing for bad deeds. Oh, I mean you have the property and you give it out to rent to somebody else. Yes, the reverse way, that's correct. Uh, do you get karma if they, you're, they're using the property for some sinful activities? Well, they're certainly not helping to purify the, the property. They're, you know, they're contaminating the property by their activities, maybe whatever they do, meat eating or whatever. This is this is a risk which you take when you rent out property to people. Yeah, you have that kind of risk. People I know generally, they, they like to, when they have a property, they like to rent it to people who they know will be vegetarian. They don't like to rent their house out to people who, if they're going to cook meat in it. You have, you have to consider but yes, it's, uh, it's, that can be a little problem. I, I don't know if you actually get the karma, but certainly the fact that they, you know, they're using the house and they're cooking meat in there, so they're leaving some uh, karma there in the house. If you go and stay in the house, of, you go and stay in the house again, <laughs> then you have to deal with that. You have the, the smell and the, 
the karma which was left there from their meat cooking. So it's always better to try to uh, find people who can be vegetarian, who can honour, properly preserve the sanctity in the property. Yes. Got it. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. One question. It, uh, we uh, come across uh, one of the family, you know, the devotee family. But devotee in the sense, wife is devotee and husband is uh, not uh, so devotee. So if husband is asking some, you know, uh, help in the finance help, so we have to entertain or how, uh, how will it, uh, because he may be using for his business or I, we don't know. Uh, but uh, is it uh, worth to uh, help him or how, how Maharaj? Well, that's, up. that's every in individual's own concern. You have to consider what is the relationship and how, you know, is, is, is it, uh, you know, a, a, a reliable venture which you're doing. If you're giving him some help, is it going to succeed? Is it actually going to help? You certainly want to be careful. It's a gamble. You're gambling. Fine, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, can I ask a small question? Yes, please. Here in uh, text 17.10, uh, Prabhupada has written in the translation that food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Yes. So, uh, actually, Maharaj, if after cooking, we are offering to Krishna. So, immediately we will consume that. But if by chance anything is remaining, what we should do, uh, Maharaj, we can consume it in the night or we should leave? Well, it's explained that for Prasada, it's all right. This Prabhupada writes here that Prasada is transcendental. So even if it's more than three hours, it's all right to consume. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, one question on Prashadam uh, only. Uh, one was about uh, honoring Prashadam, and another is like uh, serving to the Lord. So, like during festivals and all, uh, uh, we will uh, prepare and may not be actually be served the Lord in three hours. It may be four hours, five hours also. So, is that right? Yes. It's all right. Prasadam. It's prasadam for Krishna. It's okay. <laughs> it, of course, it, it, it would depend on the preparation. You know, some preparations you want to offer it to Krishna. It should be. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't go moldy. It shouldn't become stale or anything. It should be fresh. It shouldn't be too cold, if it's meant to be a, a, a cooked preparation, for example, cooked preparation, it should be hot, it should be yes. proper temperature. You don't want to serve cold things to Krishna. No, Krishna also, the deity is a person, and when we offer the food to Krishna, you know, it should be, it should be the right temperature. Just like the sweet rice, when you cook, when you cook the sweet rice, it shouldn't be too hot. But if you cook rice, it shouldn't be, you know, you cooked the rice three hours ago and the rice has been sitting there for three hours and become all dry. So you have to be careful. We have to be conscious that the deity is a person and we're cooking for him. We want to offer the best to him. So generally when we cook, you know, the rice will be the last thing we cook and then as soon as the rice is finished, immediately put it on the plate and make the offering. Right? Because Krishna wants, we want to give Krishna hot rice, freshly cooked rice. Yes, Krishna Maharaji, one more question. Yes. Um, uh, like generally, we prepare uh, uh, tiffin for uh, the husband and the children to carry to school and office. So this is done in the morning and the packed food is eaten only by 
after around three, four hours. So how is that, uh, how, how, how to manage that? Well, it's prasadam, right? You offer it before they go. It's packed food, but you... you mm -hmm. Many times it happens that we, we cook the food uh, in the morning before taking bath, because they have to leave early morning. They have to leave early morning? They didn't take bath in the morning? <laughs> you have to get them up earlier. <laughs> they have to wake up earlier. <laughs> Not very good. Didn't take bath. Yeah, okay. So first thing first thing is take bath and then prepare. Yes. Prepare yes, so that's that packed food is okay to be consumed later also. Yes. Yeah, packed food can be consumed oh. later, yeah. That's very common. You take a tiffin. Sometimes Prabhupada would go travel somewhere, he would take the prepare a tiffin for Prabhupada, take it. You know, many times Prabhupada traveling everywhere, he would never eat anything cooked by other people. He would always bring his tiffin with him, had a tiffin with him, take everything with him. And, and then in traveling on the train or on the bus or on the flight, whatever, he would serve the Prabhupada his meal. He would sit there and eat from the tiffin. Hmm? So, yes, prasada. Yeah. But, you know, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too much cold, especially in the cold weather, if you have to have cold food, it's not very encouraging, not very appetizing to eat the cold food. Oh, thank you, Maharaj. But we do need to give attention to purity and cleanliness. We, we should try to wake up early in the morning, take bath before you go in the kitchen. In the temple, they're very strict about that. All devotees coming to Mongol Arti, everybody, Prabhupada trained all of us, we must bathe early in the morning. Even we get up er so early, but you know, we always take our bath put on clean cloth and then go to temple. And somebody is doing the puja, pujari, somebody is in the kitchen, they have to make the offering for the Mongol arti also. So they, and you can see also in Chaitanya Charitamrita, if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, tells a story about Shirakora Gopina. Shirakora Gopinath, the deity who stole the sweet rice. So what happened was the Pujari, he was taking rest. And then in his dream, Krishna came in his dream and told him that he'd stolen a pot of the sweet rice. So when the Brahman had that dream, then the Brahmana woke up. And it describes in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it said, the Brahmana, before he went into the temple to see if the pot of sweet rice was there, First of all, he took his bath, even though it was the middle of the night. It was the middle of the night, he went and took his bath because he's going into the temple room to see if the pot of the sweet rice is there. So he took his bath, then he went in, and then he saw, oh, a pot of sweet rice was there. The deity had moved one pot of sweet rice. And so, yeah. Cleanliness is next to godliness. So we want to be Krishna conscious, we have to be very conscious, try to keep a good standard of cleanliness there. So th these are habits, we have, to we have to cultivate these habits to waking up early in the morning. Man many times devotees were not, you know, we're not so accustomed to waking early in the morning. Wake up at the last minute and then rush off to school, rush off to work. You know, before I became a devotee, I was also like that. As a student, when I was a student, you know, I wake up, you know, and I'll wake up and go off to class. <laughs> we have the, not the more goodness. We have to cultivate the more goodness. So, 
it's important for us. We'll feel fresh, we'll feel better if we take the full bath. Very refreshing. Okay, any other questions there? Anyone has any other points? Okay, so the next class we're going to go on to chapter 18. If you have any points about the other chapters, yeah, please bring them up. We can go over them. Well, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. How many, how many days we may take, uh, we may need for this chapter 18? Well, about three days, three classes. Three classes should be sufficient, yeah. It's the biggest chapter, a big chapter. We'll go through it all. Okay, so we'll finish here tonight. Sorry about all, all these interactions with the power, the, the electronics, <laughs> unpredictable, unstable. <laughs> Especially here in Mayapur. Mayapur is that kind of place, you know, India. Okay. So thank you very much anyway. So have a good yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Maharaj ki. Jai. Premanande. Krishna. Uh -huh.